Welcome back to COVID Catechism. I'm Father Ryan Humphreys, and talking today about the virtues that you need and that I need to go to heaven. What is it that we need to do? What are the habits that we need to build? You know, when we think about uh, about virtue and we think about living the Christian life, as often as not, really, we just think about sin. And we think about what do we need to do to avoid evil? You know, and, and I tend to think of that as a highway, right? You know, if, I, if I'm just driving down my ordinary little highway here in my little small town, generally I just have two lanes. I have my lane and I have their lane. And so all I have to think about is to stay in my one lane. I don't want to drive off into the, the ditch and I don't want to drive into oncoming traffic. And so really all I have to think about is stay between these two lines and don't screw up. Easy enough. But what about when life becomes a lot more complex? And in fact, a lot of our lives, especially after we get past the kind of adolescent juvenile stage, our lives are an awful lot more like driving on the interstate in Atlanta than they are driving on a small country road. It's not just stay within this lane then it becomes a much bigger question. I've got seven lanes, and I've got an exit on the left here, and I've got an exit every few minutes on the left here, on the right here, and then I've got all these different lanes, and I need to make plans. I need to know whether I'm in this lane, or this lane, or this lane, and that's where the virtues come in, because the virtues don't just tell us what not to do. They instruct us far above and beyond that what should we do? What is the positive thing that we have to do in order to do what the Lord wants us to do? We have to make ourselves the kinds of people who can be put at the service of the Lord. And the virtues, which is a word that we use to describe those habits, those good characteristics, some of them come from the Lord directly, some of them are habits we build up, some of them are, are really just human things, and some of them are genuinely supernatural. But they really are the difference between just avoiding bad stuff and doing that which is good. And it really is the kind of difference between just saying I have to stay in this lane and not get out of it, and how do I make the big decisions? If the Lord wants me to get off on this highway here and take that cut off there and then flip over that bridge and then come back this way, I need to know what lane to be in in order to accomplish that. And sometimes I've got to make changes that aren't necessarily logical, but that maybe what the Lord wants me to do. And so I want to talk today about this, the seven traditional virtues that the church gives us plus three more for a total of ten that are the virtues we need in order to get to heaven. Now, like I said, COVID Catechism is not here to just go through the basics of Catholicism 101. And so because this format allows you to re-watch this, uh, because this format opens the door for uh, some real question and dialogue, uh, I'm going to, to kind of do the very, very quick basic stuff and then move into perhaps some more complicated parts or perhaps some more thoughtful or, or things that we might not consider as often that I think will be helpful for us when it comes to the virtues that we're going to be looking at. Now, I should say, we, what I don't want us to do is I don't want us to use common sense definitions of these words. This is important because the common sense definition of something like hope is a hallmark card. I sure hope you feel better. Well, that doesn't mean anything. It's not at all what the Christian virtue of hope is. So, for one thing, we don't want to just use whatever common sense definition of a word comes into our mind. And for another, we have to realize that the great definitions of these words, the, what they really mean, are way beyond explanation in a short video. I mean, I think in particular about the ancient Greeks, Socrates and Plato specifically, who wrote entire books just trying to get around what courage is, or just trying to get your head around what it means to be just. What is justice and how does that work? It's not easy simply to say, here is the definition of a word and move on. Any definition we give is going to be something that calls us to think more thoroughly rather than simply say, I'll just go with the flow and whatever that means. Finally, I do want to encourage us against a thinking that we would call antinomianism. It's an error of believing that the meaning of the word doesn't matter. It's an error that's all too common in our own age where we're just told we can just make up whatever we want that to be. That's not what I'm doing here, and it's certainly not what I would encourage you to do wherever you are in your lives. 
we don't just get to make up what justice is, or we don't just get to make up what love means, for example. Love is not whatever I decide that it is, and the virtue of Christian love, caritas, charity, is not merely whatever I want it to be. And so it's really important that we don't get into that other side of that, of imputing my own way of thinking into the meaning of these words. So without further ado, we're looking at 10 virtues here that I think are hugely important. And the faith, hope, and charity are the first three. Those are tied together under the title of theological virtues because those are virtues which are fundamentally gifts from the Lord. I can't generate faith, I can't generate hope, and I can't generate charity within myself. They come as gifts from the Lord. I can make habits of working with them, but I don't make them. Then we have what are called the cardinal virtues. Cardinal from the Latin word for hinge, meaning that these are the human virtues upon which hinge our entire Christian life. And so this is prudence, a.k.a. wisdom, justice, temperance, a.k.a. moderation, and fortitude, a.k.a. strength of character, sometimes a.k.a. courage. Then we're going to have three more that I think are hugely important. Humility docility, which means being able to listen to what the Holy Spirit says, and finally, patriotism, which traditionally goes by the name of filial piety. And that one in particular is not what you think it is, and so stick around for number 10, which will be a little bit of a, an M. Night Shalom twist, uh, because patriotism is not exactly flag-waving the way you're thinking of it. It's a very, very important virtue, though, and one that we desperately need nowadays, whatever country, nation, city we live in. So let's start with charity, which is the most important of all the virtues. Everything comes down to love. Everything comes down to charity. Charity is, in the Christian context, self-sacrificial love for God, neighbor, self. Charity is self-sacrificial love. Love is an act of the will. It's a choice to put the good of the one I love above myself. And so it's a self-sacrificial thing, charity is, in which I prioritize the love, a goodness, a good, the good that God's goodness, my neighbor's well-being, and then finally my own well-being, in that order. And so when I say I love, in the Christian context, I love God, then I love my neighbor, then I love myself, and it's a choice. It's not about feelings. I can hate my neighbor's guts and still love them. It's not about feelings. It's a genuine experience of saying, I want their good, even if that means I need to sacrifice. That's what love is. It's a choice that becomes a habit and as it becomes a habit, then our emotions, our passions will follow along. Some of you are thinking about the words, uh, the, the, the ideas from the Greek that C.S. Lewis famously wrote in his book called The Four Loves, where we have agape love, which is the sacrificial form of love, the, the most true form. Then you have eros, emotion or passionate love. Then you have philia, which is this love of sharing and brotherly love. And then finally, storge, this kind of duty-oriented love. And that's all fine and good, but it becomes a little unnecessarily complicated for what we're talking about here. But love is meant to be a choice. It's an act of the will that deviates from the ideas of the world around us where we say, well, I love that person. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you right now. I love tacos. Tacos are great. They're delicious. They're one of the best things I could ever imagine eating on this planet. But I don't wish the good of tacos. I may love my neighbor who runs the taco stand, and I may love to go to the taco truck and support them by giving them money, but I don't love tacos in a Christian sense. I love my mother. I love my spouse. I love the Lord. I love my enemies. But I don't love things in the Christian sense. And so it's important that we not simply say, whatever feelings I happen to have are love that I'm experiencing. I mean, that's, that's just not a good way to think about anything that we're doing. And it's something that's become all too common. If I have feelings, good, bad, or naughty, for that person, and I love them, then all bets are off, and I should just follow my heart and do whatever makes me feel good. 
That's not love. It's not even remotely love. And someone says, oh, well, you know, we, sh- we, who do we don't get to decide who we love. We don't get to choose who we love. Of course we do. Love is, by its definition, a choice. If I have a crush on somebody as a priest, which, you know, has happened before, who cares? I can't do anything about it. It's inappropriate for me to do anything about it. It's beside the point. If I have feelings, of course I have feelings, those simply don't have to be my governor. They don't have to decide what my, what my life is or is not. And if my feelings do run my life, then all that says is I'm an adolescent. I'm a child. I'm not in possession of myself. And so the idea that love is something that I am forced into or that I fall into, it's not a Christian idea. It may be romantic and it may be great in a Matthew McConaughey or Meg Ryan movie, depending on your age group and when you went to high school, but it's not something that Christianity would recognize as even a real thing. Love is a choice, and that's why as we mature, love becomes something all the more important. We choose to love someone, and as we choose to do it, our emotions will ultimately follow suit. Uh, when When we think about this, it's important to realize that our world has this kind of aversion to us taking seriously the idea that I should be in possession of myself. And if we want to talk about the Christian faith, we want to talk about making the virtue of love, of charity, something that's a real part of ourselves, we have to ask the Lord for this self-possession. Remember, St. Paul tells us, what are the fruit of the Holy Spirit? You live a life in the Holy Spirit? If that happens, you're going to experience love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, modesty, self-possession. These things that ultimately make life worth living They come from living a life in the Spirit. They come from prayer and fasting and works of mercy, and they make us able to love well. If I've got a car with sticky steering, I'm going to have a hard time in Atlanta. I may be okay on my highways here, but I'm going to have a real hard time if I've got to make precision moves in a car that doesn't, is not in control of itself a car that, that, that doesn't have you know, adequately designed systems. And it's the same thing with me. If I'm driven around by my emotions, I can't ever hope to grow in holiness. I can't be a servant of the Lord if I can't even control my emotions or my feelings. And so a big part of love begins with this idea of possession of myself. I need to be the one making my decisions and not my emotions driving me around and making my decisions for me. The second virtue we want to talk about, and way up there on the list again, is hope. Now, hope is the sure and certain trust that God will provide all that is necessary for me to go to heaven. So God is going to give me all the things that I need in order to attain eternal life. That's what hope is is meant to be. And hope by its nature and by its definition is really about salvation. It's about saying, this world is not my end. I'm looking to eternal life and I am entrusting this most important understanding, this big giant question to the Lord. It's about realizing that the events of this life, as I preached about this morning, the the circumstances of this life are not as important as many people tend to believe they are. I may be rich, I may be poor, I may be smart, I may be dumb, I may be beautiful, I may be ugly, I may be any number of things, but those circumstances don't decide what the purpose of my life is. Going to heaven does. And so hope is that trust that God is going to provide what is necessary for me to do that. Now hope is not optimism. It's not I'm, I hope it's all going to work out. It might or it might not work out. I mean, we know for sure this world is fading away. We know for sure this world is going to come to a screeching halt at some point when Jesus comes back. So at some point, it's not all going to work out. Optimism is a largely meaningless thing. It might make it a little bit easier to make it through the day, but it's not a Christian virtue. The idea of people saying, well, don't let the negative in, that's not Christian. That's New Age neo-paganism. It's just meaningless tripe. It doesn't in any way orient us toward the Lord. All it does is allow us to hide from things that we don't feel like we can handle, which ultimately is just another way of saying, I don't believe the Lord can handle that. And so naive optimism is the opposite of hope. It's a rejection of hope. In the same way, this is not about just resignation. Well, I just have to go with the flow. I'll just hope that the Lord will give me what I need. And so I just go with the flow. 
That's not what we're doing either. This is not about simply saying, well, the world is as it is. You know, you have that great Chesterton quote that was picked up by, um, by the football coach, Vince Lombardi, you know, dead bodies go with the flow. It takes a strong living body to swim upstream. You know, we're not here, merely speaking, to just go with the flow. We are Kulturmachers, as Pope John Paul II said. We're culture makers. We as Christians are supposed to be affecting the world in which we live. And hope says, because I am oriented toward eternal life in heaven, I'm willing to risk a lot more for this world to be good, and not just so this world be okay, but so that other people can see the changes we're making, and that will cause them to look up too, to pay attention to that which truly matters. Hope is also not simply the idea of, well, it'll, it'll work out or it won't, you know, I don't really care, I don't have to, it's not indifference. It's not just this idea of, you know, of, of nihilism that says, well, whatever will be, will be. It, it, that's not what hope is either. It, genuinely speaking, it's only when we know that I am oriented toward heaven and that the Lord is going to give me what I need in this world in order to achieve the moment of judgment in my own life. It's only when that happens that I can experience this world in a way that is in some ways detached from it. I mean, think about it. If I'm super sensitive about something and somebody walks up to me and points at me and makes fun of that super sensitive thing, I'm likely to be sensitive about it. But if somebody walks up to me and says, Father Ryan, I just think that your physics is weak. I don't think that your understanding of particle and nuclear physics is worth anything. Y'all, I just couldn't care less. I mean, you couldn't pay me to care less. And so I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to get in a huff. I'm going to look and go, I'm sure darn sorry you feel that way, and then walk off. But if somebody walks up to me and decides to poke me about something that I find that I'm really sensitive about, or somebody comes up to me and really attacks something that you know I, I feel like is really important to me, that's going to cause me to really kind of get myself worked up. And that's the nature of what hope allows us to do. By knowing that we are oriented toward eternal life, it allows us to look at this world with eyes that are not likely to get puffed up and freaked out because we know that our purpose goes well above and beyond just the stuff that happens in this world. And so hope is something that fundamentally orients us toward salvation. And the more that we think about salvation, the more we orient ourselves toward heaven, the holier we're going to get and the more effective we're going to be in this world. At the same time, the more we worry about this world, the less holy we're going to get and the more obsessed we're going to be with this world. And so hope is one of those somewhat you know, counterintuitive virtues. By thinking more about heaven, we become more valuable to the world around us. So we have charity, we have hope. Let's look at faith. Faith is the third of the theological virtues. It's the sure and certain trust that God has revealed himself and conversed with the world and that he is not a deceiver. Faith is not, I have faith in you, Johnny, that you're going to win the touchdown or win the football game this weekend. Faith is not simply the idea of, you know, uh, gosh, I just, I believe that God is real. Faith is not the idea of, of you know, kind of, of, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's good and fine and wonderful. Faith is about the revelation that God has made of himself. Faith is about the revelation that God has made of us by the revelation he's made of himself. It's basically a, a way in which we say, God has told us the truth, and therefore I intend to live it because I believe the truth he revealed. And you've got to realize how big a deal that is in a world where skepticism is the norm. Remember, most people in the world in which we live are fundamentally skeptical about everything. You say to them, a miracle happened, and their first thought is to say, probably not. Uh, you know, we, we could the social media world. The first thing I see something on Twitter, and you immediately go, that might be the truth, it might not. I mean, one of the biggest problems we have with this quarantine right now, I was talking to a parishioner this morning about it, is that the trust that I have, that a lot of people have in government, in the media, in people who are in authority, 
in companies and businesses. I don't trust any of those people. I don't trust my government. I don't trust the federal. I don't trust the state. I don't even trust the local. I certainly don't trust the media to tell me the truth. I don't trust social media to give me any kind of meaningful, truthful information. I don't trust big businesses like Facebook or Google or whoever to, be, uh, to do anything in my best interest. I don't trust that any of the ads that are given to me on radio, television, internet, whatever, are anything like genuine or true. And I don't trust that businesses are going to be honest with me, even in a local way. And it's not because Father Ryan Humphreys is a terrible, untrusting person. It's just because that's the only way to live nowadays. Because we get burned so often by people lying or being dishonest or putting their spin on things that end of the day, trusting people is just not a workable solution. We can trust individuals, but we can't trust these big institutions very much. And so that skepticism tends to fold into the church as well. And so you hear the priest on the weekend preach the sermon, and you look and you say, well, I don't know if I can trust that. I don't know if that's the case. And part of that is because you heard a different priest say the opposite 20 years ago. Part of this, you know, you go to the confessional, and Father, can me and my husband use contraception? No, you cannot use contraception. It is a sin, a serious sin, and there's no meaningful moral way that you and your spouse can use contraception. Well, but Father, you know, the the bishop, or not the bishop, the priest, you know, I went to confession to two years ago, said it was fine. You know, well, he was wrong. Well, but, I mean, you know, why, why should I believe you and not him? Same thing is true of the preaching that we hear from bishops, where one bishop says this is completely okay in my diocese, another says it's absolutely not appropriate. What do you do? You, 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 you listen to the priest who says you shouldn't say that people go directly to heaven. That's not how it works. But then the deacon who did my grandpa's funeral comes in and says, oh, good, it's he's in heaven with God now. There's just a wild amount of disinformation, confusion, and all sorts of bad faith going on in the world. And so faith is the virtue that tells us what God has revealed about himself is the truth. Now, sometimes we have to dig to get at what that truth is. Sometimes we have to dig and we have to look a little deeper than simply going to a Catholic website and we have a priest who says this is the case. Even you listening to me now, I strongly encourage you to dig in. Don't just take what I'm saying at face value. I believe strongly that what I'm saying is genuinely what the church believes, and I'm not, you know, in a sense, putting any kind of meaningful caveats on it. The quotations I'm giving you are from the Baltimore Catechism. They're pretty darn specific and very, very official. And yet, at the same time, it's just important that we dig in on our own. And so faith is the virtue by which we trust that when God reveals to us that contraception is bad, We believe that and we put that into effect in our lives. When God reveals to us that prayer and fasting and works of mercy are necessary to get holier, we say, okay, then that's what I need to do. The same way that if a doctor tells me I've got to take injections for diabetes or I need to eat more or uh, eat more, uh, you know, vegetables and less meat, then I say, well, that's got to change my entire life, whether I like it or not. And if the Lord Jesus says to us that some moral thing I'm doing is wrong, or the Lord Jesus says to us, if I want to be happier, then I have got to get rid of this sin and embrace prayer, fasting, and works of mercy, then whether I like it or not, whether it tastes good, that's what I'm going to do. And so faith is that virtue by which we really allow ourselves to be transformed. This is a virtue that begins as a gift. It begins as a gift where our skepticism, for whatever reason, falls away and we say, I want to believe this. And then it becomes a habit. By trusting in the Lord, we take step after step after step, and the Lord proves that he is true, honest, that he is not a deceiver, as the Baltimore Catechism says. And so this, these are constitute the, the big virtues that we call the theological virtues. Now, we're about 20 minutes in, and so if you need to take a break, go take a break, and we're going to come back and we're going to hit what are called the cardinal virtues. Again, from the Latin carde, which means hinge. The cardinal virtues are four. There's prudence, which we also call wisdom. Sometimes it's called deliberation. Justice. Uh, we have temperance, which is sometimes called moderation. St. Paul might call it the, ver- the, uh, the fruit of the spirit of self-possession. And then we have fortitude, which is perseverance or strength of character. You could even call it courage, if you would. 
Now let's look at these with a little bit less, a uh, little bit less time than we looked at the theological virtues. Prudence, aka wisdom, aka deliberation. This is the ability to apply the truths that God has revealed. Right. This is the virtue of faith. It's also, in a sense, the virtue of charity, loving God and trusting in God. Prudence is the wisdom, the ability to apply Christian truths to the present moment and to choose that which is the best. So, so think about that a little more specifically. So I have a situation in real life. I'm right here. Now, I have a lot of different things I could do. Let's say that I find myself in a bit of a moral conundrum. And, you know, let's say, take, for example, someone called me uh, the other day and they said, hey, look, I got this check in the mail from the government. I got this, this $1,400 or whatever the number was, and I don't need it. You know, I'm, I, it's not that it's not my money. I get that, but I've got this money and I feel like I should d devote it to something. I feel like I should give it to somebody because I don't need it. And the government's giving it back and the government's trying to help people. I feel like I should do something. So this is a, a moral conundrum. Justice is that virtue, that habit, by which we take a principle that God has revealed, namely we should do good and avoid evil, or we should love the poor, or we should assist those in need, or we shouldn't covet money, or whatever these principles are, and we apply those principles to the real-life situation at hand. Now, what could that person do with that money? Well, one, maybe they just save it and they, they, they just put it in the bank for a, for a rainy day. Okay, maybe they use it to pay off some credit card debt, or maybe they use it to pay off the car. Maybe they turn that money to a member of their family who is in need, somebody who's directly in need. Maybe they give that to a local charity that they believe in, you know, the, the dog's a kennel or, or you know, a, a local rehab for, for those folks with alcoholism or whatever. Maybe they turn that money toward just give it to the priest and say, here, figure this out, go give this to somebody. Maybe they just kind of wait for the Lord to say something, and then all of a sudden a commercial comes on for the Red Cross, poof, money goes there. There's any number of different options. Those are the moral ones, but I mean, hey, they could also have immoral ones. Maybe they go and just blow the money on shoes, because why not? You know, there are plenty of moral and immoral options, but the, the virtue of prudence puts me in a situation to have a habit of looking at the options before me, and applying the measure, not just of whatever I want. Remember, I was talking in charity about the idea of it's not just whatever I'd like, whatever just emotion comes up, but I'm trying to take these Christian principles and apply them to the current situation. And so I look at my different options, and I say, you know, I've got this money, I have this much debt, I have this much I owe in my house, this much I owe in my car, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Looking at my situation, this money came to me, I feel very strongly, emotionally, that I should give it to someone. I think there's probably some spiritual virtue there, because I don't want to be selfish. You know, and I look at all the things in front of me, and so I'm going to choose to give this this way. Great! That may or may not be the best choice, it may or may not be the right choice, it may or may not be what the Lord wants me to do, but prudence is the habit by which I develop the, the kind of the natural skill to do this well. This is really the virtue that drives conscience. Conscience is a function of prudence. It's something that causes me to, to, to get, uh, kind of the alarm goes off when I'm doing something that is unwise or imprudent. And so this is something that we have to make a genuine habit of. We, we don't really have this kind of magic ability to know whether this is right or wrong, or whether this is good or bad, or whether this is the better or the best choice before us. But when it comes to the virtue of prudence, we're trying to make that decision, and we're trying to develop a habit of making it well. Now we're going to get to another virtue that's going to help us to be even more effective, but prudence is the virtue where we learn to analyze the principles, analyze the situation, and choose the best of the choices before us based upon the principles of faith that God gives us. And conscience is the way this most commonly comes to life. I should say, in order to be good at the virtue of prudence, we actually have to know what the principles are. So there's a certain amount of academic or intellectual knowledge that we need and study that needs to happen. And we need to be able to look at the world around us, which means we need a certain amount of patience, a certain amount of genuine 
uh, self-awareness, a certain amount of self-possession, so that I'm not just kind of going, ooh, I got $1,400 and I really want new shoes. And, and it, do, it shouldn't go from money in my hand to money in the till to new stuff instantaneously. So there's a certain amount of certain self-possession that I need to have in order to make this work. The virtue of prudence is followed by the virtue of justice. Justice is not fairness. It really isn't. Justice, defined by the Baltimore Catechism, is the will and the wisdom combined to render God and your neighbor their right due. Let me say that again because it's a lot. Justice is the will, the choice, and the wisdom, the knowledge, to render to God and to our neighbor what is rightly theirs. And so that, again, just like prudence before it, means I need a certain knowledge of what God is owed and a certain knowledge of what my neighbor is owed. Now, God is owed my love. He's owed my duty. I'm, I'm here. I exist to know, love, and serve God and to spend eternity with Him in heaven. I know I should prioritize my neighbor above myself. I should wish what is good for them. That's what charity is, to will the good of the other. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. And just like before, it's not as if there is an obvious right answer all the time. There may be, with that same example we were using before, you know, the government gives me some money back. Well, you know, what is the prudent thing to do? Well, I might decide that. But then I might say, but what is the just thing to do? What is, what is injustice? What do I owe to God? What do I owe to my neighbor? And that means a certain amount of knowledge from the virtue of prudence. But it also means I need to have the ability to make the right choice, even if it costs me, even if it's difficult for me. You know, the, one of the, the things that we have to keep in mind is, and we look at the scripture, is there's plenty of people who seem to know what is right and wrong, but there are not as many who are willing to do it. I mean, even the apostles, we don't have a lot of them who show they are really willing to be generous. But we have the widow's might, the little widow who puts in the two coins into the treasury that Jesus praises because she not only knows what is right, she has the guts to do it. And it's the same thing with us. The virtue of justice is not about some kind of vague sense of fairness. It's not about equality of income or equality of outcome. It's not about social justice, which is a word that is ridiculous and absurd and should have no part in our Catholic vocabulary. It is a genuine understanding and a genuine choice to give God what God is due and to give our neighbor what our neighbor is due. And again, that requires knowledge and it requires self-possession. Now, let's talk, let's talk just a moment about social justice. Social justice didn't exist in the church before the 60s. Before it, we just used the virtue of charity. We give to our neighbor what we can give to our neighbor. Social justice showed up in the 60s and tried to reframe charity, not as me giving to the one in need, but as me having some kind of effect, socially speaking, and as the church, as a corporate group, being responsible, and I, I don't mean corporate and business, but I mean as a, as a group, as a, as a corporate uh, entity, as a, as a group working together as one unit, that the church then was somehow responsible for, to change, uh, you know, the, the societal laws and policies to make them more fair or to make those people who had been oppressed less oppressed. Now, that's Marxist language. It comes from Marxism, and all of social justice nowadays, for the most part, almost all of it, is driven by Marxist ideology. It's about how can we do something for us as a group. And that's important, and that's fine, and that's good, but it's not a virtue. Because virtues are what individuals do to get closer to God. There's a wonderful quotation from G.K. Chesterton where he says, I have never walked through a park and seen a statue of a committee. Because there is nothing that the ten of us together can do which is in and of itself going to get any of us closer to heaven. End of the day, I am going to do or not do Believe or not believe what I need to go to heaven. You might help me. You might assist me. I might help you. I might assist you. We may hinder one another. But end of the day, I am going to come before judgment as me. 
the church in her infinite wisdom as the body of Christ is going to do some stuff, but that's the church with Christ as her head. Social justice, and people can disagree with me all day long, doesn't get anybody closer to heaven. Now, works of charity, charity, not justice, that'll get you right to heaven. I mean, assisting the poor, visiting those who are sick or in prison, that's good stuff. But we should not replace a greater virtue, charity, with a lesser virtue, justice, just because it happens to sound good. You can keep all that Marxism, put all that stuff, you know, about charity and loving the poor, move that up to the virtue of, just, of charity and leave it off of the virtue of justice. That's not going to get you any closer to heaven voting for the right person or, you know, or, or activism or, or protesting. Y'all, that's not going to get anybody closer to heaven at all. It might be a sin, it might be a virtue, but it's not going to be because I hold a sign and change a mind that I'm going to get anybody closer to heaven. Justice is not about fairness, and it's not about social justice. It may or may not be a good thing, but it is certainly not what we're thinking when we're talking about the virtues that are going to get us closer to heaven or not. So we have prudence, we have justice. Temperance. Temperance is also known as moderation, also known as self-possession. Tempering is where we, we kind of control ourselves and we say, you know what, I am not going to be driven by my emotions. I'm going to make decisions on my own. And so temperance is one of those incredibly important virtues that unfortunately got dragged through the mud uh, as a word going back into the 30s and 40s where the temperance movement was against alcohol, was against any kind of vices, uh, you know, and it became illegal briefly to have alcohol in the United States. And you know, it's, it's meant to be something that is far, far more than just not committing a sin. This is about strength uh, of, of um, or this is about choosing to, to do this and not do that. It's about saying, I'm going to take, I'm going to have enough of this, not too much and not too little. Now, this is a difficult one because sometimes it's hard to judge whether we've had enough good or bad of something. I mean, there are some bad things which are necessary. You know, I think in particular of a, a wonderful parishioner of my parish who just died, uh, a wonderful guy, Mr. Pat Bullard. Love Mr. Pat. He was such a good, sweet guy. Several years ago, he's in the hospital, and the doctor comes in, and he's got some little wound on his foot, right? And the doctor comes in, and they're treating the wound, and they're treating the wound. And finally, they come to him and say, look, Mr. Pat, we're going to have to take that toe. We're just going to need to remove that toe because it's, there's an infection, and we can't seem to treat it right. And so they have to come in, and they have to amputate. Well, it's not easy to decide exactly how much to take because this is an infection in the foot. And it turned out with Mr. Pat, God bless him, he had to have more than one procedure because they didn't take enough of the toe. And in a very real way, that's a big part of the way we as Christians deal with the world around us. Do When I give charity, should I give too, did I give too much? Did I give too little? I mean, I have some fellows that come around here and ask for money for me from time to time. And it's a real challenge for me to say, look, you know, I'd love to give you all the money I have. Here's $500. Take it. But if I do that, then I don't have any money for anybody else. That having that much money may be bad for that individual because they may fall into some bad habits of buying drugs or alcohol. Um, you know, and so it becomes this very, very difficult thing to say, look, I want to be charitable but I have to be charitable in moderation. And the same thing with I want to feast and I want to fast and I want to get healthy and I, I'm exercising a lot during this quarantine so I'm trying to get healthier, but you can do that too much. You know, when it comes to, to priests right now, you have a lot of priests out there who are trying to, to do things like this, you know, catechism, but also having kind of just check-ins, also taking videos of themselves, doing everything from, uh, you know, from cooking in the kitchen to, uh, you know, to giving themselves haircuts to, to doing things which are probably somewhat questionable. You know, I don't really know that it's okay for priests to play PlayStation all day long or whatever, you know, but it's, it's a very, very fine line between, you know, we want to, to show the humanity of the priest, or we want to give a behind-the-scenes look, but how much behind-the-scenes is too much, and how much is not enough, and how, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to know in a lot of different areas. What is the right balance between this and that? Where should the middle ground be? And moderation is the habit by which we do this. I eat enough, but not too much, and not too little, and I feast enough, and I fast enough, and I pray enough, and I study enough, and I, I love the Lord enough, and I'm charitable enough. Yeah, that, that, that's the habit 
of moderation. And it's a tough virtue to work on, and it's one that is as much a fruit of our life as it is something that we practice specifically, and yet it's one of these important ones. So prudence, justice, temperance, and we'll bring it together with the last of these cardinal virtues, which we will talk about as fortitude. You can talk about it as perseverance. You can talk about it as strength of character. You can talk about it as long-suffering. You can talk about it as courage. End of the day, the definition is the strength and ability to overcome temptation, adversity, and intellectual passions. And that's the big one. This is about having the strength of character to say, I really want to do this. I feel very strongly tempted to do that. I really, with all of myself, want to do this. I don't want to do that with all of my strength. I just don't want to do that. But I have the strength of character to choose that which is good for God, for neighbor, for myself, over and above whatever my own passions direct me to do. And that's really challenging, and this is perhaps the most human of all the virtues, because this is not necessarily about looking to the Lord and saying, Lord, what do I do? This is very, very much about, about making friends with yourself and saying, self, I really appreciate that you have strong emotional passions in this direction. I appreciate you have strong mental things in this direction and, and strong beliefs and core ideas in that direction, but this is the right thing and that is the wrong thing. And this is a very challenging thing to do because it really does require a constancy because, you know, somebody who has got a lot of moral fortitude and a lot of strength can become an addict to something and in a matter of months can go from being utterly self-possessed to being, you know, a drunk or a heroin addict or a porn addict or a gambling addict. I mean, just like that. And so it's something that has to be constantly practiced, and any time that we don't practice it, any time we're not moving forward, we really are falling back. It's really, really challenging to embrace this, this virtue and stick with it. So we have prudence, which is about applying the truths of Christianity to a concrete moment. We have justice, which is about having the will and the wisdom to give God and our neighbor their respective due. We have temperance, which is about the will and the ability to subjugate my bodily passions to the intellect and to the will, you know, really saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do too much or too little of this. And then we have fortitude, which is about the strength to overcome temptation and, and adversity and intellectual passions by saying, I'm in possession of myself and I'm not going to let my emotions or my needs drive me. That's not what I am. I'm not simply uh, a slave to, to my lower animal instincts, we might say. So that's part two of the talk. We've done part one, which was the theological virtues. If you needed to take a break after that, you did. These are the, the, temp, the cardinal virtues. If you needed to take a break now, now is a good time to step away. Just pause the video, give it some thought, maybe write in your journal, whatever the case might be. Maybe you're coming back from pausing the video, or maybe you're going to just come back to this another time and skip ahead to this point and come to the third talk, or the third part. But this is the third part of the video, which is the natural virtues. And so these are the virtues that we live out as a function of the others. There are a bunch of natural virtues. I mean, everything from being a good dancer uh, to being humble are natural virtues. But I want to point out and highlight three in particular that I think are hugely important. Humility, docility, and patriotism, which again I said is not what you think it is. And so let's look at, at humility first. Humility is merely the proper understanding of myself as a creature a creation, burdened by imperfect configuration to God, burdened by personal sin, burdened by temptations. Okay, a lot of words there, but what does that mean? It means that I understand myself in relation to who God is. God is God. I am not. And so humility begins by recognizing that God is, is the Lord. He is the creator of all things. I'm a creature. I am imperfectly created in his, I, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly created, but I'm imperfectly configured, is the word, 
to God. So it means I sin, I'm tempted, I make mistakes, I am selfish, I am, am uh, lazy, I have whatever temptations are my particular temptations, those things make me unlike God. And so rather than look at myself and say I'm perfect, I look at myself and say I'm imperfect. God is God and I am not. Now humility is not about just beating myself up. It's not about saying, I'm the worst sinner that's ever lived. You know, that's the butler's lives of the saints usually start off with the nun saying, oh, I'm the worst sinner that ever lived because I accidentally neglected to pay attention in prayer, uh, you know, three weeks ago. That, that's, it's not about saying I'm the worst. Humility is not about being meek and mouse-like. There's certain virtue in being meek and mouse-like, but that's not what humility is. Humility is not meekness. Humility is not about being an introvert. Uh, it's not about somebody who just likes their own company and says, I don't really want to get out there. It's not about having a small personality as opposed to a big personality. Um, it just isn't that way. Humility also is not about healthy self-perception, right? So if you're, if you're into mindfulness and all kinds of stuff like that, which you shouldn't be as a Catholic, those, that kind of healthy self-perception or I'm okay, you're okay. That's not what humility is about. Humility is fundamentally about God is God and I am not. And so when I look at myself, I recognize that I am created in the image and likeness of God, but I recognize too that I am separated from God by an imperfect configuration to him, which means I have concupiscence, which means I am tempted to sin, which means I, I am selfish from time to time. Uh, I recognize that reality. I also recognize that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and I recognize that I am tempted to sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so humility is not so much something about me beating myself up or changing my personality as it is saying, I want to focus my attention on the Lord and realize that I am an imperfect reflection of Him. And so when I look at myself and I think about myself, I don't make myself the center of all things. I realize the Lord is the center of all things. And what I'm doing here is trying to make myself a better reflection of Him. Not for my own ends or my own purpose, but for His glory and purpose. In a certain sense, this is kind of like if I were in the wedding party of the Lord Jesus. Let's say that, that you know, we're, we're all groomsmen, or if we prefer bridesmaids, of, of the wedding feast of the Lord and His church. And all of us then are making sure we're dressed right and we're primping and we're caring for ourselves, getting our hair ready, and we're there before the wedding begins precisely in order to make the groom and the bride look good. The wedding party isn't there for ourselves, but we pay attention to our looks. We want to make sure our shoes are shiny. We want to make sure we look good. We want to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do, standing on the right foot, walking properly, doing all the stuff we're supposed to do, not for me, but because I reflect the bride and the groom. And so I want to make sure that if I'm in the wedding party of the Lord and His church, that what I am doing is not about me, but it's about reflecting what the Lord, the goodness and my love for Him, and so that everybody looks at me and sees Him. That's what humility should be. St. Augustine had a, a you know, very, very strong sense of this, and he said there's only three things needed to be a saint. Humility, Humility and humility. It's really that, that important of a virtue. And so while it's a natural virtue, it's an incredibly good thing. Now, will I said humility is not the same thing as a healthy set perception or meekness or anything like that, but it will help us to grow as a side effect a healthy self-understanding. It will help us to grow in prayer. It'll help us to grow in thankfulness. It'll help us to, to grow in charity. It has an incredible set of side effects, but it's an important virtue for us to be deliberate in thinking about. The second of these natural virtues is docility. And docility is the faculty of discerning God's will in my life in an ongoing way. And so well, I talked earlier about justice, when we talked earlier about that. Justice, we use the example of someone who just got some money from the government and says, I want to do something with this. Well, justice might, or rather prudence, I should say, prudence looks at this and says, okay, 
the best decision based upon my financial situation and charity is to give 85% of that to the charity and 15% of that to make a car payment. That's what, what wisdom might say. That's the smartest move to make based upon the data I have and based upon uh, the understanding the church has given me. Well, then justice, the virtue of justice kicks in, and we might say, okay, I'm giving God his due, I'm giving my neighbor that due, and so that 85% that's going to charity, I'm going to send uh, half of that to the church and half of that to a, a charity, a secular charity. Okay. Docility, though, Docility is something that says, Lord, what do you want me to do? I know what's the right thing to do. I, I mean, I, sh I should say I have an idea of the wise thing to do, prudence. I have a sense of duty, you know, in terms of justice. But Lord, what do you want? Because Lord, you could want me to do something that is itself imprudent. You could want me to do something that is totally unjust. The Lord may come and say, look, I want you to give all of that to the next person who knocks on your door asking for money, uh, who comes with a cheesy story about trying to get from Alaska uh, to, to Havana, Cuba, on a bicycle, and says, you have $20 so I can make the rest of the trip, and you go, you've lost your mind. That's a terribly stupid story. But docility is an openness to the Lord saying, listen, I want you to do this. Give it to that person there. And even though that may seem imprudent, it may seem ridiculous, it may seem unjust, Lord, if that's what you want, then I'll do that. And you know, that virtue is in a certain sense more important. It can't exist without prudence. It can't exist without justice. But it's more important, perhaps, than any of the other virtues that have to do with choices. Because at the end of the day, God is God and I am not. And so the Lord knows what he wants from me more than I know what is good for myself. I mean, when it comes to being a priest, there was no prudence in me saying I should give up a good job and a college education at LSU in order to go and become a priest. That's imprudent. It's not logical. And a lot of people, including my parents, were clear. It is not logical for you to do that. It's also, in a certain sense, unjust. Because, you know, I mean, I didn't owe to God being a priest, nor do I owe it to my neighbor. And in fact, I could probably be doing an awful lot more having pursued the degree I was looking to pursue in college. I could probably be doing more for other people uh, in a practical way in terms of, of giving money or in terms of, of doing things that might have been helpful for them in the computer industry or whatever. So being a priest doesn't line up there. But when it comes to what does the Lord want, in a certain sense, the wisdom of God or the foolishness of God confounds the wisest of the wise. And so, end of the day, docility is perhaps the most important virtue of all of them because it really does look to the Lord and say, well, what do you want from me? What is your desire? Not what is my desire, but what is your desire for me? And so that's something we need to think about. It's something we need to keep in mind. Now, how do we grow in the virtue of docility? Well, that involves discernment. Discernment is the way in which we go about making decisions by asking the Lord what it is he wants. Now, I'm not going to do that today. Uh, it's a long sidetrack, side but I th if, you're, if you're thinking about growing in this virtue, as you should be, think about how to go about asking the Lord what it is he wants. And perhaps we'll do a whole talk on discernment, because it's, it's an important question. And this virtue, which comes about kind of naturally, but also it comes about by simply me saying, Lord, what do you want from me? I mean, I'm not looking for the Lord to give me the answer, uh, you know, from the Ten Commandments, where Charlton Heston comes down with the big beard and says, this is what I want for you. But if I start my day and I look down at my shoes and I say, Lord, which pair of shoes do you want me to wear? And I go about my day and I say, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Or, Lord, how should I deal with that? Just creating the habit of asking the Lord opens us up to the Lord giving me a sense of clarity about what he wants for me over and above what I want for myself. So none of this cancels out any of the other virtues that I've talked about. But docility does kind of orient us toward, Lord, what is your will for me in this small thing? And so that's worth thinking about, and it's worth keeping to mind. It requires a lot of practice. It's an ongoing thing that is part just gut and part actual taking time in prayer to go through a list of questions I have for the Lord. 
but it's incredibly important. And so is the more your prayer life advances, the more docility will naturally be something that works for you. But I strongly want to keep uh, and advise us to keep it alongside humility as one of these incredibly important virtues for us to hold on to. And so here we are, number 10, the last virtue that, I, that I'm calling patriot, patriotism, the virtue of patriotism. It is not about waving flags. It is not about saying, oh, goodness gracious, I come from the best darn country in the whole wide world. Patriotism, also called loyalty, also called filial piety, is simply the idea that God put me here. God put me here at this point in time. God put me in this country, in this city, in this state, in this family, in this socioeconomic group, uh, in, the, in this intellectual circle, uh, in this physical place, uh, among these friends and family connections. It's not an accident that I am where I am. And so if God put me in those places, that doesn't give me an excuse to simply say, oh, I don't have to think anymore. But God put me here. God put me here. And that's, that's something that means this is where I am called, at least right this minute, to do something. And so it's ridiculous for me to say, I wish I was born in the 1800s or the 1300s or 6000 B.C. or whenever. This is my time. It's ridiculous to say, I wish I was born in another country or another city, because this is where I am. It's ridiculous to say, I wish I was born in a different family, or with a different race, or a different gender, or a different socioeconomic place. It, it, it may be fine to say, I wish I was a rich black woman, but that's not what I am. I am where I am. I am who I am. And while I have every obligation to be the very best me I can be, and I have every obligation to God to let the Lord shape and form me to be the person He wants me to be, I am where I am. And so if I want to be Canadian, it doesn't matter. If I want to be British, it doesn't matter. I am where I am. And if the Lord calls me to move to London and do ministry there, great. I'll be an American in London, because that's who God made me to be. And so it's not an accident that I am where I am. And the virtue of patriotism, the virtue of loyalty, is not about saying my country is better than any other country in the whole wide world, but it is about saying this is the place the Lord has sent me. This is the family the Lord has given me. Has given me. And so it's an appreciation of the particularity of my life. God doesn't do anything by accident. It happens particularly and specifically for a deliberate reason. Now keep in mind, Christianity, Christianity is not what we call a religion of the book. It's not merely kind of Buddhism, a set of theories to apply. Christianity is about a passionate love affair with God who changes every aspect of my life to be entirely oriented toward Him and to help other people to discover that same passionate love affair. That's what Christianity is. And so patriotism must be passionate. It's something that we should be excited about. And so if I am part of a group that is not necessarily well respected in the country in which I live, that's fine. If I find myself in socioeconomic conditions which are not very great, it ain't great, but I mean, that's the way the Lord wants to get me to heaven. I mean, if I find myself in a situation where, you know, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not a particularly attractive person. I've never been particularly good looking. Uh, I've never been particularly dapper. I've always been heavy and, and, and overweight. Um, I've never really been good with, with certain group in terms of talking to certain groups um, and certain people. I've never been particularly suave uh, in this way or that. I've never been particularly good with money. I mean, I could list my own faults for a week. But those realities are just part of who I am. And they go into making me who I am, and they go into putting me in the situations in which I've found myself and into making the mistakes that I've made and the failures that I've made. And yet each one of those is something where I can be genuinely thankful to God and excited that God made me among the group of people who is the way they are. 
And patriotism really is a virtue in which we recognize that I am where I am and that I shouldn't spend my life thinking about greener pastures, but I should be giving thanks to God that he has made me who I am. Not that I should look around and go, thank God I'm not Irish, y'all. Could you believe? God. No. Nor am I looking around and going, thank God I'm not poor or stupid or, or uh, you know, whatever race I don't like or, or whatever creed I don't believe or thank God I wasn't born a Mormon. Or, you know, that's not helpful. But I can and should be thankful that God has given me the circumstances in, of my life as the place in which and the context in which I am to share his love. And so patriotism is an incredibly important virtue. It's an a virtue that matters for us as individuals and that matters for us in a larger scope as well. The church needs to be genuinely in love with the world in which she ministers to. And the more the church fails to love the world and to recognize its faults, the more the church will find herself, as she is now, running from her own identity in an effort to just make the world feel better about being the world. And that's a separate conversation for another day, and we've already run right at one hour. So you got three 20-minute segments today. You got a segment on the natural, or the uh, the theological virtues, where we learned about charity, we learned about hope, and we learned about faith. Charity being, of course, uh, that that ability to choose God first, then neighbor, then self. Hope being oriented towards salvation and faith, trusting that God has revealed Himself rightly. Then we looked at the cardinal virtues, prudence, which is wisdom, uh, justice, which is about giving God and our neighbor their appropriate due, temperance, which gives us the ability to, to choose the middle path between extremes, fortitude, which is strength of character, the ability to choose the right as opposed to choosing the easy, and the natural virtues, specifically humility, which allows us to look and recognize God is God and I am not, docility, which allows me to say, Lord, what do you want from me? Not what do I want, not my will, but yours be done. And then ultimately, or the final one, patriotism. Good old number 10, where we look and we say, thank God I am where I am because this is the place that God has given me. This is the context in which God has given me the opportunity to live my life, to grow in the faith, to gain holiness, and to share that with others. 10 virtues we need to get to heaven all of them doable, all of them workable. And so I hope and pray you'll listen to this talk, these talks a couple of times, break it up as you need, take the breaks you need, but practice these virtues. Because y'all, we may start off the Christian faith on a two-lane road where we're just trying not to sin. We're just trying to avoid driving into the ditch or avoid driving into ongoing traffic. We're just trying to say, help me to not sin. Help me not to do anything too wrong. But if we want to get to heaven, we're going to have to get to Atlanta. We're going to have to get to those seven or eight or nine lanes of highway where the cop passes us going 90 on the left, and we've got to get into this exit and then to that exit and then to that exit over there and then take that bypass, then go over that bridge, and we're going to need a whole heck of a lot of help, and it's going to require a lot more than just stay in between two lines. We're going to have to choose the right and choose the best and choose the better and then choose the best again. We're going to have to be people of virtue. And so let's pray for one another that we can be people of virtue today. Thanks for listening. Join us for the next COVID Catechism, which will be on Tuesday of next week. God bless you.